uh, they do not, we do not have a evidence of mutation and selection uh, accomplishing fundamental innovation, building mm. new protein folds. Mm. So you can slightly optimize ones that exist already, and you can degrade genes and the, and the proteins that are coded for them. I think that's what uh, some people really don't get, uh, Scott, is that in order for there to be natural selection, there's got to be something to select, correct? I mean, where, where does, right. how does natural selection work? What, 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 what happens? Well, I mean, that's the question. How, you know, is it, is it a, a positive process that you can start with something um, simple and make it more complex? I think the opposite is probably true. When we look at organisms, and there are many examples now that were at one time modal, they had they had the genetic information to build a flagellum, but they've acquired a mutation. And what you find over time is the system is is even further degraded. So it's a disadvantage for some organisms, you know, particularly pathogens, to make flagella in a host because we're looking for some of these proteins. And so it would be an advantage to shut the system down by mutation. But then when you see what happens over time, as the other genes downstream also become sinks for, you know, insertion elements or other mutations. So if you don't use it, it degrades over time. Mm. And that is, you know, antithetical to the process that you need for some antecedent uh, product to be held in place so that you can add to it um, sequentially uh, by mutation and selection. It just doesn't seem to work. Yeah, Steve, we can't have we it both ways. stipulate, Frank, that uh, uh -huh. ID proponents all accept that mutation and selection are real, uh, is, is a real process, a combination process, and both, both things are at work, natural selection and mutation. But what we see is that either they preserve very modest changes that slightly optimize an existing what, it, what a fundamental unit of life called a protein fold, or they degrade. And they do not, we do not have evidence of mutation and selection uh, accomplishing fundamental innovation, building mm. new protein folds. Mm. So you can slightly mm. optimize ones that exist already, and you can degrade genes and the, and the proteins that are coded for them. So uh, it's not a process that you can invoke to account for the large stepwise or uh, abrupt uh, increases in genetic information that we see arising in the history of life. And that becomes a big problem when you look at events like the Cambrian explosion, about which I've written, or mm -hmm. the mammalian radiation, or uh, any of the numerous uh, abrupt appearances of new form, uh, biological form, or what biologists sometimes call morphological innovation. Uh, in uh, 2016, a number of us, or 18, was it 16? Yeah, sorry, a number of us attended a conference in uh, London uh, held by the Royal Society, which was called by a group of evolutionary biologists who were very dissatisfied with the standard neo-Darwinian uh, story about the history of life. And they're looking for new mechanisms of evolutionary innovation because they recognize that neo-Darwinism and its mutation selection mechanism, uh, as one, one scientist put it, um, la lacks a theory of the generative. It doesn't explain major innovation. It explains, mm -hmm. in fact, we heard over and over again as uh, uh, biologists saying that uh, mutation and selection can explain the survival, but not the arrival of the fittest. It explains mm. how mm. things are slightly modified to continue to survive if you can presuppose the form and structure they already have, but the, the mutation selection mechanism doesn't explain how, how, how fundament, fundamental innovation arrived in the first place.